The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Yaron Brook Show on this, uh, what is it, Sunday afternoon. I hope everybody's having a fantastic weekend. Uh, yeah, the Run Book Show is uh, is back on a semi regular schedule. So we're doing, as we have for many uh, for a long time, we're doing um, four shows a week. Four shows a week. So uh, yep. So thanks for being here. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Colt Savage has got us off on the uh, super chat. So don't forget to use that to support the show and to of course ask questions. I do have my new app working and running, so I, I'm not gonna lose track of Super Chat questions because they're being queued here. And then every time I answer it, I click answered. And yeah, this is super cool, I think. We're, we're, we're gonna see how it works. But let's have a lot of Super Chat questions so I get to use this new app um, to its fullest. All right, today we're gonna talk about Two topics, uh, we'll, we'll see what else comes up, but uh, two topics that I have planned. Uh, one is um, we're going to talk about the myths surrounding uh, comparisons between capitalism and socialism. I came across, or somebody actually uh, tweeted to me a tweet by some economist out there saying that socialist economies uh, significantly outperform um, capitalist ones, so I want to comment on that and and just again on kind of how to how to deal with 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 this what should I call it crap um, uh, you know how to, how to how to just to just to show you kind of the uh, the um, dishonesty involved Ryan thank you uh, yeah the, the the test seems to be working let's see. I want to see what happens when I click the answered because you didn't ask a question. Yeah, it, when I click answered, it leaves the queue and it goes into the column of all the answered questions. Now, is that cool or what? That is so cool. So anyway, the app is officially working and uh, um, yeah, a lot less distraction of copy pasting, copy pasting, copy pasting. So. Uh, hopefully, uh, another little way in which we're making the show uh, we're making the show better. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, some uh, mythology around the capitalism socialism uh, debate. Uh, we're uh, then going to talk about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about supply chains. Uh, so, well, not, maybe not a little bit. I want to talk about supply chains. Uh, and what we've learned from COVID about supply chains, uh, what we've learned from the sanctions on Russia uh, about supply chains, what we've learned uh, from the uh, baby formula crisis on supply chains. So how do we integrate all this additional information into our view of trade, so-called free trade, uh, and uh, uh, supply chain management? What should we do in that context about China? Are, are we, to what extent are we over reliant on China, and whose responsibility is it? And how do you get less reliant on China um, or on Russia? And, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about food as well because food is a big one. There's a lot of talk right now about Russia and Ukraine. The rest of the world is so dependent on Russian Ukraine wheat that this is going to cause massive famines and. Of course, the, the global warming people are jumping on this because they're also claiming that there are all kind of global warming effects that are causing famines all over the place. So, so how do we kind of reconcile all of this in the context of a free trade? So uh, we will talk about that uh, as well. Hey, Simon is in Gibraltar. That's pretty cool. Yeah, if you're in a cool place, like outside of the U.S. is, is cool, um, then let us know in the chat. That's, uh, that's kind of cool to know somebody is uh, listening uh, sitting on the rock of Gibraltar and listening uh, to the Iran Book Show. Uh, so, yeah, share, share that information. Where you where are you listening from? Um, as long as it's outside the United States, it counts as cool. 
um, but I'm, I'm definitely interested. Um, all right, yesterday we had a, uh, a front row event. Uh, we had uh, 11 people, and we spent an hour and a half talking about self-esteem. It was really cool. Uh, I, you know, I give some, I just, I didn't speak. I didn't really give that many introductory remarks because at some point the conversation just started flowing. People had lots of questions. There was a lot of back and forth. Uh, it was really, really cool. Um, it was nice to get to know some of you, those who participated. Uh, it's nice to get to know the supporters. So I'm thinking, and I think self-esteem is, is, was, a, was a really good topic. And um, we didn't really get to much. We, we, you know, the, there was so much conversation. It's, uh, we didn't cover that much material. So I'm thinking of doing a part two. So I'm hope, hoping more of you will sign up when we do a part two, because I think you'll, I think many of you will really enjoy it. Let's see, we've got somebody from Tel Aviv. Yes, happy avocado, that, that, that's uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, we've got Germany. Uh, that's cool. My guess is uh, uh, we got two Germanys. Rand is also in Germany. Uh, Germany is, yeah, I mean, this time of day is, is, is not too late for Germany. We've got Bolivia. Bolivia, wow, under the Marxist, uh, Marxist president of Bolivia. Uh, we've got another Israeli. So we've got two Israelis, two Germans, one uh, South American. Uh, that's, all right, Utah doesn't count. I said no U.S., right? Utah is still part of the U.S., so it doesn't count. I'm just looking for people outside the U.S. If you're outside the U.S., let us know where you're listening from. I just think... It's cool. Um, oh, Poland. We got Poland. Excellent. I can't pronounce that. Zane Poland. God, I wish you were here. I wish you could go audio just to tell me how to pronounce it. Anyway, it sounds like a, a, a small town, a village, a, a, a city, a small city. Nowhere I've ever heard of in Poland. We got London, at least we got London. Um, let's see, we've got a bunch of Canadians, bunch of Canadians. I don't know, is Canadian Canada cool? Oh, we've got the United Arab Emirate. That's cool. That definitely qualifies as cool, right? United Arab Emirate, cooler than Canada. We got Vancouver, we got Toronto, we got Vancouver Island. Uh, yeah, more Americans. Americans just can't stay quiet because they, they want to be in on the cool stuff. So they, um, we got Bulgaria. That's cool. Um, all right. More UK. Prague. All right. We got Prague. Prague. And it's, uh, it's, uh, Miroslav. Miroslav is the one who wrote the app. So thank you, Miroslav. Miroslav who is, uh, is the one who wrote the app. It's working. It's so far stunningly cool. So uh, uh, the app came all the way from Prague, uh, next to Berlin. All right. No, well, Canada is probably cooler than UAE to live in, but to have somebody call in, uh, to have somebody listening to your on book show, um, I think it's cooler to have somebody from the UAE. It's just less um, expected, right? Less expected. You're certainly colder than the UAE. That's true, M much colder. Uh, we've got Southern Brazil, Santa Catarina Island in Southern Brazil. Uh, uh, that's fantastic. We have uh, lots of Brazilians um, listening to the show. Uh, maybe not live, but we have one live here. I don't know. Somebody said, who, who was here? They said they were, they were in Italy. Um, Best Fed Hank is near Rome. What do you mean you're near Rome? Rome, like Texas? Rome where? How can you barbecue in Rome? You can't be in Rome. Uh, all right. Well, I thought that was cool. I'm glad there's so many foreigners listening in. Uh, I know that um, to the show generally, not live, we have a lot of foreigners listening in, uh, a lot of Germans, a lot of Israelis, but primarily U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia, uh, and then we have a then we have a, a bunch of European countries uh, and, and South American countries. So 
it's great. We, we don't have a lot of Asians. So Asia, anybody, uh, you know, other than UAE is technically Asia. That's Middle East Asia. But, oh, we've got Mexico City. Uh, but it will, Rome, Georgia. There we go. He's in Rome, Georgia. Township of Rome, Wisconsin. <laughs> there we go. Rome, Wisconsin. I told you the Americans, they can't give the spotlight to the foreigners, even for a minute, right? They have to capture it for themselves. Like, it's just an American trait. They can't, they can't sit quiet. They can't be quiet. All right. So here's the tweet. Somebody tweeted to me and said, you got to comment on this. So here's the tweet. It's, it's, the tweet is from Jason Hiskell. Jason Hiskell has a checkmark next to his name. I don't have a checkmark. I tried to get a checkmark from Twitter for years. Couldn't get a checkmark. Gave up trying to get a checkmark. Don't have a checkmark. Jason has a checkmark. But Jason doesn't just have a checkmark. Jason is followed by 191,000 followers. So talking about somebody of Twitter substance, 191,000 followers. Ashton, uh, ask a question for $100. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the question. It's being picked up by my Super Chat tracker. We got this. We're on top of this. This is great. Oh, oh, this is even cooler. Oh, my God. This is so cool. So anything $20 or above gets put into a separate queue, like a priority queue. So uh, it, it, it literally is putting like Ashton and Ahmad, I might put 1999, I guess that counts, into the $20 queue. And the $20 queue is, of course, the queue I give priority to. So great program. I, you know, I don't know how difficult it is to do this stuff. I have no clue. I haven't programmed in many decades. But Miroslav, thank you. This is fantastic. Better than I expected. Amazing. All right. Cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, everything's taken care of. I don't, I, don't need a, I don't need to worry about Super Chat anymore. I'll just get to it when I get to it. Uh, the Super Chat tracker is working perfectly. All right. So this is J Jason Hickel. Hundred and uh, what did I say? Hundred and uh, ninety-one thousand followers. He's a professor, I think, of economics at ICTA UAB. I don't have no idea what that is, and he's a visiting senior fellow at the LSC. That's the London School of Economics, very prestigious place. He's the author of The Divide and Less Is More. He's an expert, according to his own um, uh, profile, on global inequality, political economy, and ecological economics. So here's a guy who's not an idiot, right? He's, he's a smart guy. He's, he's not an idiot. He's, I'm sure, well-read, uh, knowledgeable about some stuff, and uh, followed by a huge number of people. So influential, 191,000 for an economist. That's a good number. It's certainly followed by a lot more people than I am followed by. And this is, this is, the, uh, uh, this is the tweet. People often claim that capitalism performed better than socialism in terms of poverty and human development in the 20th century. This story is repeated so frequently that no one even bothers to back it up. Is it true? Is it true? I wonder. The question was explored in, remar in a remarkable paper published by the American Journal of Public Health. Using World Bank data, it finds that at any level of development, socialist countries outperform capitalist countries on key social indicators in 28 of 30 direct comparisons. He says social sta socialist states had lower infant mortality, lower child death rate, lower life uh, longer life expectancy, better literacy, better secondary education, better food access, more doctors and nurses, and, be and better physical quality of life. The, the papers pay well, so here's a free copy here. Open access version is here. Right? Uh, wow. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I didn't know socialism was this good. I, I just didn't know socialism was this good. Good. So, what's going on here? I, I, you know, so, first, he doesn't mention that this paper was written in 1986. Um, but okay, doesn't really matter, 1986. Okay, so, so I went to the paper, and I look, and uh, there's, there's a bunch of empirical problems with it, using averages and all kinds of stuff like that. But, but, I mean, even given that, 
socialism comes out, wow, doing really, really well as compared to capitalism in this paper. I mean, socialism beats capitalism hand down on almost every measure. So I wonder what's going on here? What, how could this be? Because I know, I know, without a doubt, based on empirical evidence, based on personal experience, based on knowledge of history, based on, I don't know, the Berlin Wall, East-West Germany, North-South Korea, all of that, that it's just not true. Just not true. So let's, so what's the problem? How do you explain this phenomenon? And I've seen other socialists claim this. Oh no, socialist countries do really, really well as compared to capitalism, probably based on this paper. The first time I've seen this paper, 1986. Um, and, and it's good. I'm, I'm glad that he put it up uh, so that it is available for, um, for everybody to read so uh, we don't have to go through the paywall. Uh, so that's good. It's, uh, so, so here it is. So I went down to the appendix and I said, okay, I wonder, I wonder, I think you would wonder too. I wonder how he defines capitalism, how the paper defines capitalism, and how the paper defines socialism. So I wonder what countries get defined as capitalist countries that he's comparing to the countries that he defines as socialist. So, I mean, socialist countries, this is 1986. Uh, I'll give you some examples. He defines socialist countries as low-income China, uh, lower-middle-income Cuba, Mongolia, North Korea, Albania, upper middle income, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, USSR, Czechoslovakia, East Germany. So he's basically defining as socialist countries, countries behind the Iron Curtain, countries that are part of the Soviet Union, uh, which is interesting. First thing to give you a little hint about maybe there's problems with the study is there are no high income socialist countries. They're upper middle income, and one wonders if USSR was really upper middle income. But no upper income countries. And all Soviet era, okay, China, 1986, define a socialist, maybe, depending on your purpose. Okay, I, 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 can, I, can, I can roll with that. That's fine. So socialist countries, okay. These are, these are socialist countries. That's good. These are real socialist countries. Now, let's look at how he defines, who he defines as capitalist countries. Capitalist countries. Now, this is where it gets really, really, really interesting. Right? So, low-income capitalist countries. Are you ready for the low-income capitalist countries? I didn't know there were any low-income capitalist countries, but it turns out they are. Here's the list of low-income capitalist countries. Bhutan, Chad, Bangladesh. Bangladesh, in 1986, was a capitalist country. Nepal, Burma, Malai, Malawi, Zaire, Uganda, Burundi, Upper Volta, Volta, I don't even know what that is, Rwanda, India, Somalia, Tanz Somalia, Somalia, Tanzania, Guinea, Haiti. Haiti is a capitalist country. Um, Sri Lanka, Benin, Central African Republic, Sierra Leone, Madagascar, Ni Niger, Pakistan, Pakistan, oh, the, the bastion of capitalism, Sudan, Tongo, Ghana, Kenya, Senegal, Mauritius, uh, Mauritana, Yemen, Liberia, and Indonesia. Wow. That's low-income capitalist countries. How about low-middle-income capitalist countries? Lesotho, Bolivia, Honduras, Honduras. Did you know Honduras was capitalist? I did not. Zambia, Egypt, Egypt. Egypt. El Salvador, Thailand, Philippines, Papua New Guinea, Morocco, Nigeria, on and on and on. Jordan, Syria, Paraguay. And in 1986, South Korea. Upper income, upper middle income, Iran, Iraq, Algeria, Brazil, Brazilians out there, did you know your country in 1986 was capitalist? High income. Well, high income is the, the, all the Western countries. And then he has high income oil exporting, but these are oil exporting capitalist countries. Libya, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and United Arab Emirates, 1986. 
Um, let's see. Here's a, here's a link. I am putting the link in the chat for the paper. There you go. Uh, link for the papers in the chat. So you can go look at it. Now, basically what they've done is they've taken uh, socialist countries and then um, they've defined every single other country in the world as capitalist because they're not socialist. Because I've told you before, people, people generally, cannot think beyond two categories. Socialist, well, if these countries are socialist, then everybody else is a capitalist. That's it. That's the only way they can think about it. Imagine the results would be a little different. And if I defined capitalist countries as the Western countries, United Kingdom, Japan, uh, Finland, Australia, Canada, Netherlands, USA, Belgium, France, Denmark, West Germany, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland as capitalist, and then said everything else is socialist, which is, by the way, much, 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 much closer to truth. I mean, it's ridiculous. What does it mean to say that Bangladesh is capitalist, or even worse? What does it mean to say the Central African Republic? What does it mean to say that authoritarian regimes, that monarchs, that, that, um, that anarchy, that, well, uh, anarchy, or that uh, countries that have zero, zero respect for property rights, countries that have no respect for contracts, countries that have, I mean, that's enough. If you don't have property rights and you don't have contracts, it, nothing else matters. You don't have capitalism. You, you just don't. Capitalism is defined by, even on the most simplistic level, now, I would define it by the protection of individual rights, but okay, that's a, a difficult concept to comprehend. Property people get. Contracts people get. And capitalism is inconsistent with authoritarianism. Now, that I think people have a hard time with. But at the very minimal, at the very minimal, property rights, protection of contracts, rule of law. How about rule of law? Those three, at a minimum, would be required to qualify as capitalist. So I'm OK with saying there's a third category that neither socialist nor capitalist. Fine. Although most of these countries in Africa were run by rulers who considered themselves socialist. Now, he claims that these definitions come from the World Bank. Now, maybe, but then the World Bank is unbelievably ignorant, biased, ridiculous, stupid. And I'm being nice to them right now. So this is to tell you, I mean, the reason I mention this is that how you categorize things how you define things, what things you put together in a bucket in under the same conceptual folder matters a lot. If you put Bhutan, Chad, and Bangladesh together with the United States, and then you say, well, capitalism didn't cure poverty, then yeah, but are those three capitalists? Obviously not. So how you categorize things? What you mean by different things, how you define them, and even having a definition is crucial to understanding, to knowledge, to, to going anywhere in life, to getting anywhere in research, to doing anything constructive. You have to have your conceptual house in order, which means having clear categories, clear definitions, and making sure that what you include in those categories fits the definitions. Obviously, the World Bank had no clue. Now, I'm curious to what extent this is reflective of the World Bank. I, it, I find it difficult to, to imagine that this, the World Bank is a stupid, but it's completely possible. It's completely possible. Possible. I mean, um, a Brazilian says, in 1986, Brazil was not allowed to import computers and software. Capitalism? 
Is capitalism related to free trade? Anybody? Anybody? Going once, going twice? So truly mind-boggling. Um, when this is considered research, when this is considered uh, an academic paper, refereed, uh, you know, peer-reviewed, uh, published, and that a senior, whatever, fellow, a fellow at the London School of Economics with 191,000 followers thinks this qualifies as science in any sense. I mean, they have, I, I notice this, Richard Wolff does the same thing, right? And Vosch did the same thing in my debate with him. Anything that's not socialist is capitalist. So ancient Egypt, when they built the pyramids, capitalism. I, you know, uh, uh, the slavery in the South, capitalism. Um, feudal society, capitalism. I mean, Karl Marx would be embarrassed by these people. Marx had a better understanding of what capitalism actually was. And he didn't have a good understanding of what capitalism was. But he had a better understanding of what capitalism was and its, its results than, than these people. The standard, and, and I'm, I'm curious to see the research, the standard should be property rights, contract law, rule of law, and some semblance of free trade. Something like that. You can come up with some criteria. But it has to be Anyway, <sighs> the world is nuts, nuts, or, or unthinking, unthinking, detached from reality, which is nuts. That's what mental illness is. It's a detachment from reality, inability to see, understand, comprehend reality as it is. That's mental illness. These people really are not right. All right. Let's take a break before we get to Russia, China, trade, and supply chains. Let's take uh, our four $20 plus um, questions from the Super Chat. The cool thing about this is they're right here, and they're in the priority queue. I don't have to go looking for them. This is so cool. I'm so happy. Um, Ashton asks, do you think it's even possible for the United States to fall under totalitarianism on either side of the political spectrum? Um, I don't think today. I don't think right now. But I do think that with the right consequence, with the right um, context, with the right circumstances, with the right, um, uh, I don't know, events leading up to it, and with the right demagogue, with the right kind of uh, leader, uh, charismatic leader who brings together left and right under the right kind of banner, I definitely think it's possible. There's no reason to assume. And I think Everything we've seen in American politics over the last, I'd say, 10 years suggests that it is very possible. Uh, there is definitely a desire, both on the left and on the right, uh, to, to have a, a kind of a, a strong man who can do no wrong, whether it was Obama or whether it was Trump, just a, a, a worship of the personality, of the person, uh, and, um, and, and a kind of a, tri a mindless tribalism. That, to me, suggests the opening for authoritarianism. And now it's a question of how do you bring them all together? How do you, how do you create a platform that can unite them, a platform that can, that can have them um, integrated together, right? So uh, that's the standard. By the way, for those of you uh, who are wondering what order I'm answering the questions, I'm answering the questions not in the order they were received. I don't usually do that. I answer the questions in the order of the dollars put to them. So first question I answered was Ashton's for 100 bucks. The next question is going to be Ashton's for 50 and then I'll do two $20 questions, and then I'll go on. So if you want to sneak in a question into this period, into this Q&A period, do a $20 questions. Otherwise, I'll answer the questions at the very end. Um, Let's see. So, um, you know, what is the combination of uh, issues? I think my general belief is it would be patriotic, it would be religious, and it would be environmentalist. But exactly how that plays out, I don't know. Uh, you know, you usually uh, authoritarianism comes up 
in the face of some threat, internal or external, uh, whether it's a series of terrorist attacks, or it could be Islamist, could be something else, whether it's some kind of uh, crisis, economic crisis, economic collapse. Hard to tell what the circumstances are, but the agenda is going to be generally a statist economic policy, a uh, pro-America, kind of an America first attitude, a, so a, a patriotic, a, a nationalist, a pro-environment attitude, and a religious theme that goes through all of that. that that's my view, but exactly how it plays out, I don't know. All right, Ashton also asked, why do left-wing intellectuals like Noam Chomsky, Michel Foucault, etc., think anarcho-syndicalism is the future economic and social structure of civilization? People like this think capitalism will just be abolished by the forces of history. Well, partially because they're, they're heavily influenced by Marx, and Marx um, believed that history was determined um, and that capitalism was just a phase that we had to go through. Uh, he wasn't anti-capitalist in, in that sense. He believed capitalism was a necessary evil, necessary though, uh, had to go through it, but that the forces of history ha had to make it go away because it created... Uh, these unsustainable realities, uh, inequality where the rich accumulate all the wealth and the poor gets poorer and poorer and they will rebel. Uh, it, it, you know, in modern times, maybe it creates uh, a polluted environment, creates economic oh, cycles, economic cycles and, and recessions that people will rebel against. So capitalism inherently is, according to Marx, self and according to Chomsky and Foucault and so on, self-destructive. It's anti, particularly Chomsky and Foucault would say it's anti-man, it's anti-human uh, being, it, it's destructive to people, and therefore people will rebel against it, uh, no question. So, um, and, and they believe that the solution to capitalism, since they claim to be pro, quote, freedom, is anarchy, so, so, you know, no authority that can be captured by the powerful. And, uh, of course, their uh, anarcho-syndicalism is exactly that. It's captured by, you know, all kinds of groups and, and, and pressure groups and, and influence groups, and it's, it's captured by little minorities, oh, little majorities. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's it, it, what they what I think they ultimately realize, because ultimately they're nihilist, is that it's destructive, it's, it's suicide, it's completely insanity, and of course you have to have a state in anarcho-syndicalism -syndic because somebody has to stop the capitalists from starting companies and employing people. Somebody has to stop private businesses from competing with these, uh, I don't know, uh, co-ops that won't be able to uh, won't be able to uh, compete. So uh, I think that that is um, that is what will that is why uh, you know they, they think it's inevitable. The capitalism is self-destructive. Okay, Hamad asks. I've been listening to you for years now. Thank you for adding value to my life. Oh, great! Thank you, Hamad. I hope life in the UAE is is good, um, and uh, and I'm glad you're listening. That that's great. Thank you. It's great to have influence and impact on people's lives all over the world. It's, it's you know, I'm, I'm a well-known globalist um, and in a sense of, I love the world. I, I, I'm, in, I'm inspired by people all over the world. I don't just care about Americans. I don't just care about America. I care about good people all over the world. And I am, uh, I'm for globalization. I'm for um, good parts of different cultures and different uh, cultures it, it, it being embraced, uh, and I'm a huge fan of immigration and a huge fan of trade. So um, if you want to, people have labeled me a globalist uh, for that, so I'll take it. What are thoughts on the book Think and Grow Rich? I don't really have any thoughts on the book because I, I, I don't really know it. I'm, I'm suspicious of any book um, that gives you a simplistic, if you will, formula for getting rich. I don't know if that one does or doesn't, so I, I haven't read it, so I don't know. But um, 
getting riches is, is, is hard. It requires a, both hard work. It also requires real thought. I like the title of think and grow rich rather than um, it requires real thought. Uh, but, but mostly it requires um, either having very, very unique skills or starting your own business or uh, something like that. And um, if it recognizes the, the, the challenge and the achievement that is involved in getting rich, then that's great. Um, but, I, but let me know if you think it's worth checking out. I, I have not checked it out. Um, yeah, somebody says, I love the world and the ideals of America. Yeah, I love the ideals of America. And sometimes those ideals of America can be found in other places. Um, and it might be that the ideals of America survive long term, not in America, because the direction America is going right now is away from its ideals, away from its ideals. Yes, I'm using a stand-up desk. Always. I think all my shows since the beginning of YouTube have been me on a stand-up desk. Um, I've been using a stand-up desk for six, seven years now. Uh, I really like it. Um, certainly since 2017. Um, yeah. All right, let's see. Uh, what do we have? Um... Yeah, let's talk a little bit about supply chains. One of the uh, things that have uh, made uh, standard of living in the United States and in the rest of the world, for that matter, um, as high as it has become over the last, I'd say, 40 years, one of the things that has allowed for economic growth to continue in spite of the ever-growing regulatory state, in spite of the fact that taxes are... are, 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 are higher and higher and more and more manipulative in spite of the fact that our educational system is horrific and, and I think educational system all over the world are not particularly inspiring. In spite of all that, the economy has grown, quality of life, standard of living has gone up, uh, people are living better lives. I think life today is much better than, um, than uh, it has been uh, in, uh, in the past. Uh, life has been getting systematically better decade by decade by decade in spite of people from the right and the left denying it. I think the reason for that has been, uh, you know, you could call it globalization and a real revolution in uh, the thinking about supply chains. Uh, the shift to just-in-time inventory management, uh, real uh, application of scientific knowledge to supply chain management. Now, what is supply chain? Supply chain is the, the, the chain of events, the chain of actions that is taken from the point where a product is manufactured to the point where the consumer picks it up, buys it and picks it up. So everything that has to happen the, 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 the manufacture of all the pieces that go into the product. So I, I think I've told you the iPhone is made in 60 different countries. Pieces of the iPhone made in 60 different countries. The supply chain includes the production in each one of those countries. The delivery from each one of those countries to any other intermediate places where they need to be assembled to the final assembly, to the shipping, to directly to the consumer or the shipping to the Apple store or the shipping to warehouses in, in Amazon and then Amazon supply chain from the uh, 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 warehouse to all of you. So everything that has to do with the movement of the goods from the point of production of every piece of it, including the mining, going back to the mining, every piece of it, all the way until it gets to you, the final consumer, all of that, all of that is the supply chain. All of that counts as supply chain, and managing that supply chain is complicated. And an immense, huge achievement. It is absolutely non-trivial. There's an immense amount of thought 
effort, math, algorithms, computer power, lots of strategy and thought that goes into devising and running and deploying effective and efficient supply chains. And one of the idea of just-in-time management, just-in-time inventory management, is not having to, not having to, thank you, uh, Kirill, I appreciate it. Um, not having to uh, hold on to a lot of inventory because you know where every item is at every point in time. You know the entire supply chain. You can play around with it. You can add, you can, you can, uh, you know, adjust the levers to increase supply, decrease supply based on demand, and you can do it in real time. Do it in re real time. And it's, it's stunningly amazing, efficient. Uh, Jennifer says this is all called logistics, yeah. It's all the logistics. And all of it is coordinated, of course, by the price signal. You know, you can read Hayek for that. You can read a textbook in economics for that. You know, where resources are meant. But even within a company, there's massive supply chain, if you will, centrally planned. And manages, it's, it's amazing how you get this to the Apple store on time. Rarely do we have to wait. Rarely are there lines, except when it first comes out. Now, one of the things that about 40 years ago started is that you could now shift some of the manufacturing to places that had manpower resources you never had before, uh, places that had uh, a variety of different infrastructure and logistics that didn't exist before, so that you could now diversify your manufacturing in all kinds of places around the world. You could set up warehouses. You could set up production in all kinds of places around the world. You could also benefit from the skills people had all over the world because by driving the cost of the supply chain down lower and lower, where something was built, where it was assembled, where it was sold, all of those, it didn't matter. Because the cost of transportation, the cost of coordination, the cost of all of that was relatively minor. One of the things that did that, I did a whole show on this a couple of years ago, I think, was uh, the container ship revolution. Having containers ship goods all over the world and building container ships specially designed to carry containers lowered the cost of shipping of goods to almost zero. There was a period where it was almost zero. There was so much supply of ships that, that prices really went down to almost zero. Now, that happening over the last 40 years has made it possible for goods, primarily for goods, but even some services, to slowly, systematically over time decline in price. If a good that is consumed by people declines in price, just that raises the standard of living. Now, one of the challenges that happen, I think, and that we're, we're now coming to grips with, and I think COVID uh, and what happened in Russia has now made this very real, is for a variety of reasons, China became the primary place in which people outsourced to. That is where people uh, set up, if you will, their supply chains, their production, their assembly. And the reasons for this are multiple. Uh, China was opening up. It suddenly had 1.2 billion people who were looking for work. So it was a massive, huge number of available employees wanting to work, willing to work, willing to work hard at pretty much any price because the alternative was so low. It, so it was cheap and massively plentiful. Now, it wasn't very productive labor because they weren't very skilled. 
But suddenly there was this inflow of massive number of laborers, which was very appealing to a lot of companies to move production to where there were laborers, but it was more than that. Certainly by the 1990s and 2000s, China was also producing large numbers, really unbelievable numbers, of engineers, tens of thousands of engineers a year. So if you needed skill laborers, really high skill laborers, China was the place you went. China also invested massively early on in infrastructure, highways, uh, high-speed trains, and ports, and airports. So China made it easy to integrate it into the logistics of the world. It had ports, it had massive port capacity, it had a number of amazing natural ports. All it had to do was grow them, improve their technology, and the most advanced ports in the world, the most advanced ports in the world, well, where robots do most of the work rather than unionized, expensive unionized labor, are in China. So you get this massive increase in technology at the infrastructure level in China, so that if you produced in China, you could easily get the product to the port because of the highway system, and then you could easily ship it because the ports were so efficient. Again, computerized, roboticized, not having to deal with unions and corruption and everything else that goes along with it. And therefore, shipping took off. And shipping through China took off. China also has the advantage of sitting on a lot of ocean front, sitting on uh, waters where they can easily go south and then west towards Europe, towards the Suez Canal and Europe, or directly east to the west coast of the United States. So they sit in a beautiful strategic place for the supply chains. So what happened, and, and one other element about China, is that China was embracing business, embracing profit, the, the profit motive, um, embracing foreign investment, embracing foreign expertise to come into China. And it appeared until about six, seven, eight years ago that it was embracing more freedom. It was moving in the right direction. And as a consequence of all that, a consequence of the, uh, the, the geography and the, the fact that uh, uh, you, you know, it had the, it, the investment in infrastructure and the fact that there were all these people available to work, whether it was low-skilled or high-skilled labor, and the fact that the country was becoming more free and the fact that the country was, was uh, welcoming of business and the profit motive and entrepreneurship. Because of all of that, China became a powerhouse, a productive powerhouse. And as part of that, American business started increasing their investment in China. And uh, sadly, what happened is that the supply chain became very narrow, if you will. Uh, companies it, it forgot, forgot, ignored, started to ignore the concept of, there used to be, I remember we, we, we talk about this in the 80s and early 90s, used to be a concept of country risk or political risk, which was the idea you don't want to back one particular country too much because, you know, you don't know if, if the, the ruler changes or an authoritarian comes to power or they get invaded or something like that. You want to have some country diversification. You want to factor into any investment you make into a country. What is the risk that your, your project gets nationalized? Or what is the risk that uh, uh, sanctions are placed on the country and, and you lose your investment? What is the risk that this country gets engaged in war and, and you lose the project? I have a sense that in the 2000s, maybe in the mid-90s to the, to the mid-20-teens, or maybe until, to, until the, the, inv the Russian invasion of Ukraine, COVID, 
people stop thinking about those risks. It's like, what's going to happen to China? Nothing's going to happen to China. Just keep investing. You know, we could invest in India as well. Eh, China's just easier. Let's invest in China. India, uh, infrastructure in India sucks, so we're going to just invest in China. And what happened is that businesses stopped diversifying. They became globalists, but really they, were they became completely dependent on China on one avenue, one set of infrastructure projects, one channel for distribution. And I think that that is what, to a large extent, we're suffering today. So a few things have happened since then. One, China's taken a clear turn towards authoritarianism and against markets. It is far less friendly to entrepreneurs, to businesses, to profit than it used to be. It is reverse course and is moving fast towards greater and greater state intervention. It's becoming more and more of a status country. Two, with COVID, we realized that whole countries or whole parts of countries can be literally shut down, locked down, production stopped, zero, nada, ports closed, ships can't go anywhere. COVID destroyed this idea that in a sense, China or any other country would always be open for business. And we're seeing even more of that right now. Where whole cities like Shanghai are shut down because of COVID. Whatever is produced in Shanghai usually is not being produced. People are not going to work. Production is not happening. But the same is true of ports that are closed, shipping can't happen. Or ports on this side of the Atlantic, uh, of the Pacific that can't, uh, Atlantic or Pacific doesn't really matter, that are closed. So there's no unloading, reloading, not enough trucker. I mean, just the whole COVID thing created these distortions and perversions, but created an awareness that countries can get shut down, that you can't rely on one path, and that too many of our things get produced in just one place. And then finally, I think the Russia example, here you have a war, completely unexpected. Nobody, no corporation in America, I think, put in a one-year plan the probability of war, even a 10% probability of war. I don't think it was in their minds, their consciousness. It was just not possible. There's no war. War never happens. And then a war happens. And not only does that shut down certain parts of the supply chain, natural gas, oil, wheat, other, other agricultural products that are produced in Ukraine, but then you get sanctions, all kinds of sanctions that shut down whole other parts of the supply chain and basically make both Russia and Ukraine take them out of the global trade market which is having, going to have huge implications for food because uh, Ukraine and, and Russia, that, the, the part of Western Russia, are, are real breadbaskets, and now that food is going nowhere. It's created, of course, we know the problems of natural gas and oil and the dependency of certain parts of the world on particular pipelines, on particular supply chains, and suddenly we realize this conception of just in time, not holding inventory. But much more important than that even, the conception that we can concentrate all of our production or all of our anything, any part of the supply chain, if we put it into any kind of bottleneck, if we put it into, if we rely just on one country for any particular resource, whether it's food, wheat, like Ukraine and Russia, or whether it's manufacturing like it is in China, or natural gas for Europe, Russia. That opens it up to real disaster. What we used to call, and somehow I've forgotten, country risk or political risk. Country risk and political risk are real. Yeah, here they are. 
We're living it right now. Now, what is the solution to this? Now, many of you think, maybe not many of you, some of you think that the solution is government forcing companies to onshore, government placing tariffs, government controlling trade, government creating, I don't know, reserves of uh, using the using emergency provisions to bring in, uh, to fly in, uh, what do you call it, uh, baby formula, government, you know, chewing out CEOs, telling them where to put their plants. And you know that I'm not going to support any of those. The solution is more freedom. The solution is free trade. The solution is for the United States to lower tariffs to zero unilaterally. The solution then is for businesses in their own self-interest to start diversifying their supply chain. I just read yesterday that Apple is doing that. I've actually been reading this for the last, really since COVID, really since Trump's tariffs, that Apple is looking at both Vietnam and at India to put manufacturing plants. I'm eager for the day when people start looking at Africa as a place where they could put manufacturing plants and use all that to diversify the supply chain. <laughs> that is, make sure that you're not solely reliable for any piece of the supply chain on one source. I think there's going to be a rush to look for natural resources. You, whether it's rare metals, whether it's other forms of metals and gases, and make sure that there's not one supply, supplier. I think Europe is going to look at pipelines, maybe from Azerbaijan, maybe from UAE, maybe from Israel, to supply it with natural gas over the long run so they're not dependent on Russia. I think manufacturers are going to start moving more manufacturing from China to Mexico from China to other countries, uh, as, you know, as long as Mexico doesn't go the route of authoritarianism, which unfortunately it might be. But moving it to other countries where there are good terms of trade with the United States, for example, and where, and they won't move all the manufacturing because again, you don't want to be totally dependent on Mexico. So they will move some of it and they will take the hit that comes from less economies of scale in order to achieve diversification when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to sourcing of materials. So I think what you're going to see in the next decade is business, not government, business, diversifying their own supply chains. For example, Taiwan is the main source of semiconductors. What would happen if you had a war in Taiwan? I would be surprised if you start seeing construction of semiconductors in places like Thailand, although Thailand doesn't have great ports, I don't think. Maybe in other places, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some in South Korea. It would be great if there was a place in Latin America where you could produce, effectively produce semiconductors. Right? It would be great if the United States renegotiated Trump's horrible NAFTA so that we had real free trade with Mexico and Canada, which would increase production in Mexico, increase Mexican imports. But we had that opportunity. Trump had the opportunity to renegotiate NAFTA, and people said, oh, he's going to make it a free trade zone. And of course, the opposite happened. He made it less free. So what I think we'll see over the next 10 years is diversification. I'll give you one simple example when it comes to food. Africa has incredibly fertile land. Africa could become the breadbasket of Europe. Um, Africa could really be investing in agriculture. It's close to Europe. Um, it has a lot of potential for great ports. Um, I think some African countries have good ports. 
it needs to produce. It needs to produce goods. The best way to do that, the easiest way to do that, and it would happen very quickly, is if Europe chose to lower tariffs on food coming in from Africa to zero. Now, Europe won't do that for a variety of reasons, but think of what that would do. It would create a massive industry in, in, in Africa. It would start supplying Europe with food. The food would have to be of high quality because Europeans are food snobs. But the Africans can develop the technology, can buy the technology, can get the technology to develop and grow and produce that kind of food. Who would be hurt? Well, farmers in Europe would be hurt. Many of them would be go out of business. But prices would plummet, and many Africans would get rich. There would be a strong incentive to establish rule of law in Africa. There would be strong incentive to establish property rights in Africa. And Africa would benefit. Europe would benefit. Yes, a few farmers would go out of business because they couldn't compete. European farmers probably can't compete anyway. So there's plenty of people in the world. There's plenty of talent in the world. There's plenty of resources in the world, natural and other, and human resources. What's missing in the world is freedom. And one of the things that happens for businesses in under freedom, or relative freedom, is that we learn from our mistakes. And I think business has learned from COVID and has learned from the war in Russia and has learned from Trump that global trade is not stable, global trade is not to be counted on, and there are lots, and they need to really think long term and really think need to diversify. And I think that's what business will do. That's what it rational, long-term self-interest of business to do. Now, do I think that countries are going to help by lowering tariffs? No. Do I think Europe is going to lower tariffs to zero to, and, and import food from Africa? No. Unfortunately, I don't think any of that is going to happen. Africa, one of the, one of the positives in the world right now is that Africa is putting together an inside Africa free trade zone so that they're lowering tariffs to zero between African countries, which is terrific. Now they just uh, need to lower and have lowered tariffs to everybody else. Anyway, uh, so the solution to supply chain problems is more freedom, less tariffs, fewer trade barriers, and let, let companies rise or fall based on the decisions they make. Let companies diversify their supply chains as needed. Right. Objectivists constantly criticize countries where communism crushes individual freedoms. We're constantly criticizing uh, everywhere, not just communism, where any country that is crushing individual freedoms, whether it's in China and what they're doing to individuals, I constantly criticize China for that. It's sad because I thought China was on the right path away from crushing individual freedom. I, by the way, I don't think China is capitalist. I think uh, communist. I think China is much more fascist than communist. So um, there's no um, objectivists are constantly criticizing the, uh, ab the, the crushing of individual freedom anywhere that it appears, anywhere in the world. Whether it's done in the name of religion in a place like Iran, or whether it's done in the name of communism in China, or, they, or, or, or in any way. But I don't think that the fact that it's being done is reason for the government to step in and determine uh, where manufacturing should happen. That should be up left to individuals. That should be left to people. All right. Let's see. All right. So we're going to turn to Super Chat questions. Um, and uh, we are, where are we, uh, Catherine? 
I think we're less than half of where we need to be. No, we're just over half of where we need to be. So we're, we're at about $330. So we've got $270 to raise before I finish answering all the questions. So we've got about a half an hour to raise $270. I don't think that should be that big of a problem. I think uh, Ashton uh, putting in about 150 bucks is, is about half of what we've raised so far uh, puts us in, in, a, in a great position to uh, raise the uh, $600, which is our goal for every show. I'm hoping that of the 123, 125 people watching live right now, there's some people who would like to ask questions, like to use the Super Chat, and people who want to support the show, value for value. If you get value from what I say, you can show the value. Um, you can show the value. So, uh, oh, we need $328 uh, dollars to reach it. So we have not reached half. So actually, Ashton has given more than half. Um, uh, to the show, so I'm hoping that some other people step in and get us the $600 uh, uh, pretty quickly and uh, and uh, get us over over the $600 goal. Uh, this is what keeps the show going. Uh, this is the income that keeps the go show going. We need $330 to get to a show. Otherwise, Catherine's not going to be happy. Catherine's responsible for the 600 bucks. Kirill. Uh, Kirill says, uh, hi, Yvonne. You were recently in Prague. I was. And I was on my way to see your lecture, but I got into a car accident. Oh, I'm sorry to happen. I hope everything's okay. It's nothing serious, he says. Just the scrape of the bumper. That's good. I was hoping to get a copy of Equal as Unfair signed by you maybe next time. Yeah, I'm sure I'll be back in Prague. Um, uh, I like Prague. Uh, there's always stuff going on in Prague. So, uh, you know, uh, hopefully next year or, or in the fall of this year, I'll be back in Prague and uh, we can get the... Book signed. Of course, you also can attend the um, uh, Ayn Rand Institute European Conference, which next year will be held in Athens, I think in April sometime in Athens. So uh, you can come over and uh, participate in that. And um, yeah, I'll sign your book there. I'll sign your book there. But I, I'm, I'm sure I'll be in Prague as well. Um, All right, let's see. Colt. Colt says, yesterday I was going to ask Alex if he had to give a, get to take a shower after going, uh, going on the Candace Owens show back in 2019. Oh, wow, you're going you're gonna to create a lot of enemies in the chat, Colt. A lot of people here love Candace Owen. Love Candace. I'm not one of them, but a lot of people here love Candace Owen. Um, but I figured that that would have been impolite. I think it would have been impolite, so I'm glad you did not ask it. Um, you could have asked it, put it this way, you could have asked it uh, nicer. Yes, uh, Catherine, uh, Athens, Greece. Athens, Greece, next year, 2023. I think in April. I'll, we'll have the date soon. And uh, Athens, Greece, not Athens, Georgia. Athens, Greece. So then Colt says, uh, also, any thoughts on the primaries? Um, thoughts on the primaries. I mean, I think the main thing that I'm taking from the primaries is, is that much to my disappointment and much, I think, to the detriment of America's future, uh, the Republican Party is Trump's party, even if it's not Trump's party in the sense that they all vote for the candidate he endorses. It's Trump's party in their attitude. It's Trump's party in their positions. It's Trump party in, in the complete disrespect for any reality and any truth and, and uh, anything like that. It's Trump's party in a sense that the candidates are not pro-free market in particular. It's all about the, uh, the, the, the so-called culture wars. Uh, it's Trump party because they adore Trump. But it's Trump party because that approach to politics and that approach to life and to the world is what dominates the Republican Party now. There, there is no other Republican Party. So while tomorrow I think Trump is going to uh, lose, in, the, in a sense, in the Georgia uh, gubernatorial primaries because uh, his nemesis, the current governor of Georgia, is going to win, um, it doesn't matter because uh, so many people in every part of the ballot uh, are committed, even if they're not committed to Trump as a person, are committed to his ideas, are committed to his attitude, are committed to the, the, 
the, the fact that the election was stolen and things like that, even if they don't believe it, they feel like they have to say it. That means that he just dominates the party. And I think the scariest part is going to be when we get down to the kind of elections of election officials, the people who certify elections. That's going to be scary because if we put in a, a bunch of conspiracy theory kooks into those kind of positions, then forget about having actual elections and fair elections. Of course, you know that at that point, the Democrats will do the same thing. They'll put in people who don't care about anything. Now, I know many of you think that's the case already, but I don't think it is. I think we still have basically fair, if flawed, elections in the United States. Um, I think that's history if Trump gets his way. Uh, Happy Avocado asks, what is, tr what is, um, what is my favorite Bond movie? I really liked the first couple with, with Sean Connery. Um, I thought that those, uh, those were terrific, uh, non-cynical Bond, serious Bond, heroic Bond. I thought those were good. But I also like kind of the latest few Bond movies. Um, the beautifully made... Uh, Phenomenal, obviously, special effects and cinematography, but also the, um, uh, I thought, was it Daniel Craig? I thought he plays him straight. He plays him heroic. He plays him, right, it, he goes away from the snarky, make fun of, don't take this too seriously uh, 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 kind of attitude uh, that, that I, think, I thought actors had towards the Bond character. So uh, I, I've liked the last few movies. Uh, in the Bond series. Again, the plot has never been that important. It's the attitude, it's the vibe that you get from it. Um, why objectivists don't criticize Israel over its multiculturalism policy, over its anti-multiculturalism policies? Israel is one of the most multicultural... I don't know what multiculturalism means in your context, and uh, I don't criticize Israel for that because I don't think they're wrong. I do criticize them when they violate the rights of Arabs. I criticize for them, but, but that's not a major feature of what Israel is about. So I think uh, Jao, who is also a um, Brazilian, obviously, is on a thing of all caps, why don't objectivists criticize? Um, all right. Uh, thank you. Happy Avocado. Let's see, uh, Kirill asked another question for $20 or $21. Um, we are, by the way, at 300 basically, so we're, we're still looking for $300 um, uh, in order to get there. <laughs> Psycho Speak says, Israelis are collectivist religious freaks. It just shows you how ignorant people are. Uh, Israel is a more secular culture, at least used to be, in many respects than the United States is. I was shocked when I emigrated to the US. I was shocked. Having grown up and lived in Israel most of my life, I was shocked how religious America was as compared to Israel, particularly where I grew up. So uh, give me a break. You have no conception. They're collectivists. But religion, for the vast majority of, of, of Israelis, religion does not play a significant factor in their lives. Kiro says, I wish I had a chance to ask Alex about the heat wave India is currently facing. They're using it as proof that climate change is an existential crisis. I say it's proof that India needs more fossil fuels so they can churn up their AC. Absolutely. More fossil fuels can, can get more AC. India was hot even before the heat wave. India's needed AC for a long, long time. They need AC. I India's always had heat waves. I don't know if this is the worst heat wave ever recorded. I, who knows? But of course, we haven't been recording things that long. Um, but it could be that the world is getting harder. It could be that life in India is going to get ha harder and they're going to need more air conditioning. Yep. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> uh, I'm reading the, I'm reading the chat. Uh, psycho speak is, is here to harass me with his nonsense. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think you're on the right path, Akil. Oh, Ashton, God, you guys are leaving the Super Chat completely for Ashton to get us to 300 bucks. Somebody has to step in here and, and diversify 
income, uh, diversify the money flowing in. Um, Ashton says, what do you think of Christopher Hitchens as an intellectual? Obviously, you would agree with him about religion, and Christopher was one of the greatest orators, debaters, uh, created some of the greatest arguments against religion I ever heard. But he was a, a socialist. Well, he, he moved away from socialism towards the end of his life. He was certainly a committed socialist in the early 80s when he was young. He became less and less of a socialist over time. He also had great things to say about Islam and about the West post 9-11. I had a lot of respect for Christopher Hitchens. One of the things that I really respected about him was that he, um, he thought Ayn Rand was the enemy. He talked about Ayn Rand quite frequently as the enemy. But he was honest enough of intellectual to see her as the enemy and not ignore it and, and, and feel like he had to say something about it. So I give him credit for that. Um, I agree with him about religion, yes. Um, but as, I, as you said, and I don't think it was that great of a debater because in the famous debate between Christopher Hitchens and... Uh, Christopher Hitchens, another socialist and, and some objectivists, he got crushed. He, he was an awful debater. This is in 82, 83, something. He was terrible. Um, so I don't think he was that good of a debater, certainly not on socialism. He was a good debater when it came to um, religion. He was a good orator when it came to religion. He was a good intellectual when it came to religion and when he talking about Western civilization and talking about the Islamist threat. I think he was a good... He was good in all those issues. Um, but when he talked about socialism, was wasn't very good. He, he was charismatic. But again, uh, he was very charismatic. But, he, but when you go back and look at the debate in, um, in the 80s, I think it was with Harry Binswang. Um, I can't remember if it was Leonard Peikoff there. Leonard and Harry versus, uh, versus Christopher Hitchens, and some other guy. He was pathetic. He was really, really bad. No, because, uh, so, so that's my view. But I, but I respected him. Uh, so I, I didn't call you an idiot for disagreeing with my view. I, I called you an idiot for having that kind of view. It's, uh, it's an ignorant view with no knowledge of the subject. Uh, you shouldn't go on chats and spout about things you know nothing about. Um, your view on, uh, I was critical of America because I wasn't born here is... is you know, maybe, maybe it was more objective about it, is just ignorance. So you, 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 what you're commenting is silly, is stupid. So I called you an idiot, not because you disagreed, but because, because you are commenting on things you know nothing about. And that's not something a smart person does. You stay quiet about things you don't know anything about. Or you pose questions, but you don't spout off. All right, Liam says, is it true that Ayn Rand said she could not have written out the shrug without being on amphetamines? Will drugs in the future raise all our IQs and capacity to focus? I don't know if she said that. I, I know she used amphetamines, but I don't know if she ever said she couldn't have written it without it. Um, that's possible, but it's, uh, it's not, um, I, I don't know of that statement. Uh, will drugs in the future raise our IQ and capability to focus? I think... I don't think that, you know, focus in objectivism has a particular meaning. I don't think that it, um, it raises your focus. It, it allows you to, to, to exert mental energy for longer. And I think we will develop drugs that enhance our cognitive abilities. I don't like the term, I don't like IQs because it's a, it's a, it's a fairly silly test with fairly silly numbers that people blow out of proportion in terms of its importance. So I don't use IQ, but intelligence is certainly a, a thing. And I do think that drugs in the future will be able to enhance our ability to uh, do tasks uh, that, that require intelligence and, 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 and concentration and uh, time and energy, intellectual energy. Uh, by the way, uh, technology already does that. That's called computers. Computers make us significantly smarter in, in that sense. Computers make it possible for people with relatively low IQs to do work that they couldn't, well, there I used IQ, I shouldn't use IQ, with relatively low intelligence to do things they, they couldn't have had a chance to do 50 years ago. So uh, computers enhance the ability of people who are not that smart to be productive. And that's amazing. And that's why 
uh, uh, worrying about, uh, I don't know, the IQ of people in Africa is irrelevant, particularly given that IQ tests are not made for people in Africa. They're made for people in American classrooms. Um, but that, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's why Jordan Peterson is wrong about worrying about people with very low intelligence. It's because technology actually enhances it, makes it possible for them to be productive in spite of that. Um, Harper Campbell asks, what is an uglier, more authoritarian and malevolent language, Russian or German? Um, I mean, that's completely subjective. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I have a particular, I particularly dislike German for a lot of reasons. It's primarily because it's the language the Nazis spoke. Um, so so I, it, it grates on me. It's always been associated with in my mind, growing up as a child, with the Nazis, with Hitler yelling in that language, with everything else, um, so it's 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 to me it has to be it has to be German. All right, Samson and Belize um, asks if Ukraine war outcome is uh, both sides lost, while U.S. taxpayers are out fifty four billion. Imagine the effect they'll have on U.S. elections. You and neocons will have ensured Trump 2.0 has a majority in 24. Way to go, Iran. Um, uh, why? I, I don't get any of that. I did not support sending $54 billion uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. So don't blame me for the $54 billion that the US sent to Ukraine. That's on the people who voted for it. I wouldn't have voted for it if I was in Congress. I, I don't support foreign aid. Um, I think we could have supplied them with weapons without sending them $54 billion. Um, I don't think the Ukraine war is going to play much in the uh, 2024 election. I, for that matter, I don't think $54 billion is that much money in the big scheme of things when it comes to the 2024 elections. Uh, it's pocket change uh, in, in a Trump world or in a Biden world. This is partially why they all voted for it. It's, it's, it's not that significant. But... No, I, 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 I mean, clearly Russia's lost, uh, but, but everybody loses in a war. I, I've said this many times when I talk about war. Nobody gains in a war. I'm not, I'm not sure what, what the alternative story should be. I should uh, be pro-Russia because uh, that will prevent Trump from winning. I should be pro... Um, what should I be pro to prevent Trump from winning as if I had the power to prevent Trump from winning? But what is the, the right position to prevent Trump from winning. The United States shouldn't take a position, let them just play it out and, and not militarily support either side. That would be evil in a sense that some people, uh, some side, one side is good and one side is evil. It would be evil to, to, to not take sides. Um, so I'm not sure what, what, what the issue is. Whatever happens, everybody loses. Should we have supported Russia so they could win so that then Trump wouldn't get elected? I think, I think if Putin wins, that supports Trump. Uh, hopefully, by Putin losing, um, people look at Trump and say, this loser Trump supported Putin. We don't want, to, we don't want him. But 54 billion, I, I was always against the 54 billion to, you, you, to uh, Ukraine. I, I don't support, I didn't support the Marshall Plan. I certainly don't support sending American taxpayer money to Ukraine or to anybody or to Israel. I don't support giving Israel the billions of dollars we give Israel. I don't support foreign aid, period. Unless it's directly defense related and directly in America's military self interest. Um. If Chinese culture is all about meritocracy, why do they embrace communism? I, I don't think they do embrace communism, Hopper Campbell asked. I don't think Chinese people are communist. Um, I don't think that, uh, I, I, I think they embrace authority, unfortunately. They always have, they had an emperor, they had rule by experts in a sense of a meritocracy. Meritocracy is, a, is very apropos to China, imperial China, because they, you passed the test, and if you were really, really smart, you became part of the government bureaucracy, and it was, it was all based, power was based on merit, except for the emperor's birth, but everything else was based on merit, based on tests um, and qualifications. But 
all in the name of statism. So they always been authoritarian. But I don't think China is communist. Um, you know, again, it's it's it, it's not egalitarian. It's not. You know, we spend more percentage, uh, greater percentage of our GDP on welfare than does China. We have more socialized medicine in America than China does. China's a fascist country. It's not communist. And I don't think the Chinese really supported Mao's communism. I think they went along because they, they, they hated what came before. And they, uh, they will go along pretty much with any authoritarian. Remember that Deng Guacek, the opponent of Mao, was also an authoritarian. He was just a right-wing authoritarian. Uh, and he was an authoritarian in Taiwan. Taiwan was a dictatorship for many, many years, for decades, before it became free and, therefore, and ultimately rich. So um, it's not about meritocracy as they understand it is within the state. But I think if you go to China and you talk to Chinese people and you watch Chinese work and you watch their ambition, they're not communists. They don't believe. They're, not, they're less egalitarian than Americans. They want to get rich. Does hitting your child teach avoidance of pain rather than obedience? I don't know. I, I, I don't think you should teach obedience. I think sometimes, the only times I can think that hitting a child is justified, and I generally I don't think it is, is when they do something that if you had just left them alone, reality would have slapped them. They would have got run over by a car. They would, something bad would have happened. They would have fallen down and really hurt themselves. And you are trying to, this is what would happen to you. Don't do that again. Something like that. But, but I generally don't believe in hitting children. Uh, Michael asked, can science go beyond the senses? If your test comes back positive for cancer, you can't feel the cancer with your senses. Yeah, but how do you know how do you, how does how every aspect of the, how do you design a test? How do you administer a test if not by using your senses? So uh, everything is based on the senses and then you can extrapolate. You can use, and you can use tools to enhance, if you will, the evidence that comes in. But it's all ultimately based on sensual information. How do we know there's such a thing as cancer? Ultimately, because we can see it. You can open a human being up who had cancer, and you can see the cancer cells. And then you design tests. You look under microscopes. Ultimately, the design of the test is, is by use of sensors, and then by, of the sensors, and then, but of course science can. I mean, I, I've never seen a black hole. I, I, I can't see the speed of light. So of course science can provide us with information that the senses cannot. But you cannot have science without the senses. All right, let's see. We are at $420 or so, 180 to finish. I've got, probably, I've got two quick questions, so we should be done like less than five minutes. So if, if you want to support the show, if you want to take this opportunity to support the show, now's a great time. Um, if you want to ask a question, now's a great time. Um, with the super chat. Otherwise, we'll take these questions and I'll bid you a good weekend. Okay, what do you think of Berlin? Is there an objectivist presence in Germany? Yeah, there were like two people listening to the show uh, from Germany earlier, uh, maybe more. Germany is one of the places in the world that most listens to my show. I think it's uh, uh, outside of the Anglo-Saxon countries where they speak English. Germany, I think, is number one or number two, certainly number one in Europe outside of the UK, where people listen to my show. Ayn Rand's books are in German. Uh, there are people there. There are objectivists in Germany. I don't like Berlin because, again, it's too, it's too reminiscent. Uh, there's too many reminders um, of, uh, of all the, the, the history. Um, so I don't particularly like it. Um, and I, I don't like the language, as I said. There's a great museum in Berlin with some phenomenal art. Um, I think East Berlin is being rebuilt, and it's it's a pretty cool place to drive around. But I, I don't particularly like it. It's not one of my favorite cities. I've been there a few times. Um, last question, uh, Frank asks: Do you agree with Frank Zappa? This Frank Zappa quote about unions: Too many people do too little work for too much money, and then go on strike for more days off. 
Yeah, basically, that's how unions have evolved. I think, unfortunately, that's primarily um, a, a consequence of, of, of bad union leadership uh, and uh, bad philosophy by the you people who join the unions. I don't think unions have to be that way. I don't think unions um, are necessarily that way. But um, it, it, certainly is, uh, it certainly is the way unions are. So yes, on that issue, I certainly agree with Frank Zappa. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, don't forget, if you want to support the show, you can support the show um, on yvonnebookshow.com slash support. Of course, you can still do a super chat and, and make Catherine's day because she is really upset because the streak is being broken. Um, it, it's been a long time since we haven't made $600. But I guess now that we're back to having so many shows, uh, maybe maybe it's it's a little rougher. Uh, but it would be good uh, to, to get a sense of, of uh, it would be good if we did make it on a consistent basis. So again, but the way to support the show on a consistent basis, uh, to show your support, value for value, particularly those who don't listen live, which is a vast majority of you, like 5,000 people listen, don't listen to the show live. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the, the 5,000 of you who are not listening to it live, please support the show. Uh, value for value. I assume you're listening because you get some value from it. You can do so. And those of you who support it, I, I'd appreciate if you consider increasing um, your support so we can expand, do more. Uh, the show, uh, you can do that in your runbookshow.com slash support on Patreon or subscribe star on Locals. Uh, and the next show will be on Wednesday. So this week, shows will be at 8 p.m. East Coast time on Wednesday. And on Thursday, uh, Monday, tomorrow is my birthday, so I'm skipping the show. And Tuesday, I've got a dinner appointment, dinner meeting with somebody, so I'm skipping the show. So, okay, everybody, uh, enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you all on Wednesday. Bye, everybody.